And talking about things I don't know, I also wanted to mention this because I saw this post a while back, um, courtesy of Julian the Huxtable. So big up Julian the Huxtable. She was talking. She was talking a lot about GHB. And I actually am happy that she's speaking about it so honest, so openly anyway, because you'd imagine on her side of things, especially considering the stuff that they see when they're touring around the world and going around Europe and shit, they, they see a lot of fucking crazy shit. And I've only seen a small section of it, but I can only imagine what it's like actually on a week to week basis. So Julian Huxtable posted the following tweets on her account saying as follows. We also need to be honest about the effects of G. This false narrative that it somehow has no side effects is not true. Getting off can be very intense if you have dependency because of withdrawals. Certain substances are difficult to moderate and this seems the case with GHB. My only experience with GHB personally, well, I've had two experiences with GHB. Number one is first getting introduced to it. This happened to be also in Bergheim. One year in Bergheim, I went and I was queuing, I'm pretty sure in the downstairs toilets, I'm not sure which ones there, but they're the ones that you come in on the ground floor. They're, the, they're actually the nicer ones because I think those are the ones that they feature on the websites. Those are the ones with like the shiny, with the shiny steel doors that has the LED sort of thing on the side and shit. They look fucking incredible. It's like some sort of like, it looks like, like something out of some early 2000s sci-fi movie. It's fucking incredible. So I was queuing outside of those toilets in a very stinky queue, in a very mishmash queue all over the place. Everybody cutting in all this malarkey. But I was lucky enough to like get chatting to people around me and I befriended a group of gay guys and they did the most amazing thing they could ever do. And they invited me into the cubicle with them. That's usually a stamp of approval. That's usually a marker that you're a cool guy, especially as a straight dude. When gay guys invite you into the cubicle, that means they trust you in their space. That means they trust you amongst them and they're willing to, to let you come in. They don't, they, they know you're not a fed. They know you're going to have a good time and whatever it may be. Because if you're waiting in that queue to go in yourself separately, you're going to wait a fucking long time because everyone's going in groups of 10. They're taking ages there. Some people are fucking in there. It's a fucking nightmare. So I was gladly able to go in with them together. When I was going in there with, together with them, I just assumed everyone was doing what everyone was doing. But then the next thing I do when I turn around in the cubicle and they lock the door, they get he, the boy gets out or the, one of the guys gets out a bottle of water, which I think is water. But then he opens he opens the bottle, he takes the cap off and he starts pouring a little bit of water into the cap, and then he passes the cap to somebody in the in in their crew. They drink. He pours it again until he goes around the whole group. Then he asks me, "Do I want some?" I was like, "No." And I was like, "Oh, what is that anyway?" I was like, "Oh, it's GHB." And then they start talking about why it's so good and why they like it. And effectively, and what I remember they said to me was that the high is quite nice, they feel. It's also one of those drugs that doesn't require you to drink a lot of alcohol. Allegedly, there's no come down. Allegedly, that's what they say. And you can, if, and you can, if you're strict about the dosage, you can moderate it in a way where it can kind of sustain you for the night without you being too wired. Because some of the, some of the worst things about going out sometimes, even when you're not on drugs, I think sometimes, when you go to like a techno event or or like a nightclub in general, even if you're sober, just the energy of people and the music and the volume can just get you like super wired. Like you can just be like very alert. And sometimes it's hard to turn that down when you want to go home. So what they said about GHB is that it gives you like a moderate high, but it's never really like ratty. It's never like right on the edge. You're kind of like nicely high so that if you decide to go home in an hour, you can slowly wind the night down without kind of like still being up at like 4 a.m. and your jaw clenching and shit. So that's when I heard the good side, the quote unquote good side of it. Then we left the toilet cubicle, we all hugged each other and went our separate ways. Then the second time I saw GHB being used, that was a bad time. That again was Boiler Room. So that again was Bergheim. And that actually was the famous night that I kind of bumped into Julian Huxtable and, you know, didn't have the best interaction, but it is what it is. That things happen. But I remember that same night that I saw Julian Huxtable in Panorama Bar was the same night that some girl was in Panorama Bar that was absolutely smashed. She looks awful. Gaunty face, ratty, kind of like a zombie. And me and this other girl that I met in a club were trying to help her out. And we had no idea about GHB at that time. I guess we were both quite naive. We eventually start to help her and to get her some help and shit and find her friends. And then when we, when we eventually find her friends, because it takes us a while, we realize, oh, they're not, she's not lost or sad or whatever. She's just really fucked up on GHB because the friend looked equally as zombified. And as soon as we handed them off to the friends, they kind of disappeared and scurried away like cockroaches. We never saw them again. And I remember thinking, man, that's a really 
horrible thing to see. And of course, as we were going back upstairs to kind of party again at Panorama, I remember seeing a girl who looked like she'd been fucked off G getting chucked out. And I remember reading later on in the in the in you know in Reddits and stuff and forums and and you know comments that in places like Berlin specifically, not sure if the same in London, but in Berlin specifically, they are very nervous and very worried about GHB. A lot of the clubs there ban it. They have signs where they ban it and shit, but people still do it. But they also have a zero tolerance policy. If they find out you're fucked off, but if they find out you are fucked up of GHB in some Berlin clubs, they'll chuck you out, no questions asked. Like, just go out, don't care what condition you're in. No, you don't do that shit in here. So it can be very, very, very lethal and very, very scary. But again, there's all this law, as, as General Huxable mentioned, there's all this law, all this, you know, false stories about it being quote unquote safer than most drugs. It's quote unquote relatively cheap than certain drugs. You don't need to take it with booze. It's good calm down. So I think people are kind of enticed by it. But I've seen so many negative stories around it. I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'll stay away. I'd rather stay away from that sort of stuff. And clearly, in places like Berlin, it's absolutely ravaging the scene. It's tearing through the scene. People are getting super addicted to it. It's turning people into nasty people. People are losing friends, jobs, all these sort of things. That drug is destroying people. And I've heard of people actually going to like afters, you know. And again, Berlin's one of those places where people are partying from Friday to Monday anyway. But I've heard because of GHB, it's stretching these afters. So like Wednesdays and Thursdays, you know, people are going hard. Um, next slide. Um, a person replied to what General Huxable said and said, yeah, one of the reasons why I stopped partying in Berlin is because people are just not looking out for each other over there. Enjoying is part of going out. But why do I have to drag somebody collapse out of a random dark room after nobody reacted to the lifeless body on the floor for an eternity? I've seen that. I've seen random people on the floor, passed out, on the bench, and people are literally just walking over them. <laughs> literally just stepping over them on their way out somewhere else. Like, it's not my problem and shit. And usually, most of the time, from my experience, it's usually too much G or too much Ket. Those things can just get you in a spiral. And by the time you realize, it's a bit too late. And then Julian Huxtable realize, um, replies and says, when I threw a party here, I guess you've mentioned, I guess that means Berlin, with a cis someone was in the green room, non-responsive. And I was the only one who thought it was emergency. And I don't care if the likelihood of them dying is slim. I cannot erode my capacity for care by ignoring someone unconscious. Opposite of community. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm the same. I remember that there was some guy that I was standing next to. No, I was standing next to this guy's girlfriend. And he kind of collapsed in fabric. And we all kind of got him some help. But I remember like the lack of action and the lack of response people around was kind of startling. Don't get me wrong. I guess if you go to nightclubs enough of the times, you're going to find enough people who are going to get fucked up and sometimes reacting shocked and scared all the time can be a waste of an emotion can be a waste of fucking energy but this guy looked like he was really going through it, and people were just not that concerned i think a lot of people's humanity kind of erodes and you know when they clubs and maybe it's just the drugs also because drugs inevitably uh, for the most part they do kind of make you a little bit selfish, especially class A's. They make you very kind of wrapped up in yourself. You're talking at people. You're doing your own thing. You're kind of running and gunning. So maybe part of the the negatives of doing drugs when you go to a club is the fact that you kind of lose a bit of your, you lose a bit of humanity and empathy for people, and you don't really give a fuck if they're on the floor strung out and shit because you don't want to get involved because it might ruin your night. Another another tweet, Coach Junior Huxtable. I had a dangerous combo of anorexia, extreme al alcoholism, and bundle addiction until I was 25, 26. I would black out and become non-responsive until somebody brought food and water. My friends called me out one night when they were about to call an ambulance because people thought I was dead. My friends were crying. It was really intense. I woke up thinking, LOL, I did a thing I do when I black out. But the response to my, of my friends got me together, or at least started to. But it's death with alcohol with people. It's diff but it's different with alcohol because people treat alcoholism normal. Exactly. That's a very good point. There's a lot of people out there that have proper addictions, that are proper suffering. But because it's alcohol and everyone kind of drinks, people kind of turn a blind eye to it. But then when it comes to the harder drugs, everyone's got kind of something to say, which I can understand why some people that do the harder drugs will sometimes hide their usage because they don't want to be called out. And they hate that feeling of like kind of being like, you know, always sort of like called out and seen that way. And they'll just do it in, in secret. And of course, doing it in secret can lead to other issues because then there's no one to kind of like, you know, check in and make sure you're okay because you're doing it on your own by yourself in your house somewhere. You're not telling your friends and you're trying to keep it under wraps, but then you might put yourself in danger. So it's a fucking crazy, crazy spiral. Next one. I'm praying that the G 
Uh, duh, duh, duh. I think was that? Yeah, I'm paying that. I'm praying that the G rage gets under control. Sissies are passing out, and it worries me. Icons count. Icons, which I which I love, whatever. It's a good point to make. I'm praying that G the G rage gets under control. Sissies are passing out, and it worries me. Icons can't be given this. That's the major thing. That's the major thing. Icons can't be given this. If you actually are in this. For the love of the game, you're here to fucking create memories. You're here to leave a lasting legacy. You have something to say. You have something to share with the world. You can't be giving somebody that's not in control of your vices, that's not in control of your addictions, that's letting yourself go and get fucking crazy and just kind of losing it all and then not being around to give people the art that you are so blessed, you know, to have and to kind of share with people. And it continues. What is it with Gundal that has people out here like this regularly? It really be heavy on my spirit sometimes. Like it can't be given this. I don't know what to do. If this is causing this many people to reach the point of psychologically shut down. Oh no, sorry. If this is causing this many people to reach the point of physiological shutdown, there is body slash emotional dissonance that forms when it happens again and again. And it sets a dangerous precedent for care of self and others. It's too many people I love that are out here right now so to not to speak up. Another person says, I struggle to talk to friends and loved ones about this without coming off as judgy and risking them concealing their use from me. We've already tried banning G in various contexts. It didn't work. Yeah, the banning thing doesn't work at all. This person is completely right. The banning thing doesn't work. People are always going to get those stuff in. They're always going to figure out a way to make it happen. But I do wonder, like, if you have friends that have an addiction, like, what do you do really? Because that is the danger, isn't it? If you kind of, if you kind of like straight up ask your friend if they've got a problem, if you try and confront it, more than likely it's not going to end well more than likely it doesn't end well they're going to probably shut down they might completely cut you off or cut you out of their life and then what you know then you have somebody out there who's no one's really paying attention to who's no one's really keeping an eye on and then they end up getting in fucking more issues and more trouble so i wonder what do you actually have to do if somebody's got a problem do you just go along with it and hopefully you can kind of like rein them in when you're out with them do you try to like approach it in a different way and take them out somewhere and then kind of broach the topic? Like, how do you even approach it? Like, it must be so hard to kind of deal with. It must be actually just as bad to deal with yourself when you're going through the addiction and you're going through that pain of trying to kind of keep your vices in control, but they're overtaking your life. It's probably as painful for you as it is for your friends to watch you kind of deteriorate over time and then feel helpless that they can't really, you know, help you and get you all fixed up and shit. And sometimes you have to let people just play out the way it plays out. And sometimes when it plays out the way it plays out, it could end fatally. So I guess your friends have to just take that chance and hope that you will forgive them in time. I hope so. It continues. And that's about it. Yeah, that's it. So big up um, Julian Huxtable for sharing that and being honest about it because I think these conversations are needed, especially within the dance music scene, especially within the Blood Clark dance music scene. But again, 